Hi, everyone. Welcome to Carrie Northington Podcast. Carrie Northington here. And today I have a treat for all of you. I have Jay Cohen, the CEO of Metabolic Nutrition. He is going to talk to us a lot about team building, about strategy, operations, how we got started, what it really looks like to be an entrepreneur and then build your company. Um, He has a, a very, very interesting story. He has a plant. He has purchased a lot of the equipment himself to make sure that he can keep tabs on the quality control. And he gives so many great nuggets, some recommended reading, anyone who's considering going to business or anyone who's just interested in how it works, you're going to want to hear from Jay. And just so you know, right now I do have a hot seat program available. I am taking new fitness and nutrition coaching clients, and I would love to work with you. So you can find me at carrynorthington.com or carrynorthingtonfitness.com. Okay, now here we go. And we're going to hear from Jay. everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I am beyond thrilled that today I have one of my longtime friends. We met many moons ago when I was competing as an IFBB pro, Jay Cohen of Metabolic Nutrition. He's the owner, operator, founder, and the story of how it got started is amazing. He's a food chemist, master has a master's in nutrition sciences, and is a previous bodybuilder himself. Um, Jay, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Carrie, thank you so much for having me. It's it's really great to get back in touch with you again. I know we've tried to keep touch over the years, and it's like, uh, I think the closest we've come to actually seeing each other is on this podcast. It's always been text message. (laughs) Oh my gosh, isn't that the truth? Because we were doing, we were together a lot when the shows were really popular with the expos, but I don't know how big those are anymore or how many people are kind of, it it used to just be the only thing, right? Mm -hmm. We would all get together. And and, and that was really what the industry was uh, like really based upon. It was like these, you know, these fitness competitions, bodybuilding shows and you know, all the brands would come, come together and we would all, you know, we had a whole team at metabolic and we would have, you know, you were part of that team. You would travel with us to all these different uh, states and all the different competitions. And let me tell you, it's, it's really changed a lot in three years. It is, it has gone to where, I I mean, in 2015, 2015, I think right around there, 2015, 2016, um, I was traveling 40 weeks out of 52 weeks out of the year. I remember traveling so much. And I have to say, just as a side note to everyone listening, it was one of my absolute best experiences to date was working with metabolic nutrition. Um, And whenever I would talk, oh my gosh, absolutely. And whenever you and I would talk, my favorite thing was you really took the time to get to know all of us. And you shared so many gold nuggets. And that's why as soon as this podcast started, I'm like, I have got to reach out and see if you would share. That's awesome. Oh, I, I just had such a blast talking to you. And I remember one of the stories you told me, like, do you mind explaining a little bit of how you got started? Because I think most people would assume that you've always had this dream of running a dietary supplement company, but it's not, that wasn't really the case. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually kind of fell into it. I always thought that, you know, I love nutrition and being in, in, you know, in bodybuilding and, and uh, I did powerlifting, competitive powerlifting for a while. Um, I always thought like, okay, that's great. That's my hobby, but I kind of know nutrition and I kind of know, you know, kinesiology. I know how my body works, how it functions. I always felt like I was going to go more in in line with something. And I love the nutrition aspect for it. So I thought I'd go into geriatric nutrition. Maybe I'd work for, you know, Johnson and Johnson or, or another, um, or another, uh, uh, you know, type of, um, pharmaceutical company, you know, make an an insured type product or work in a hospital setting and, you know, be like more guiding patients diets through, you know, that type of nutrition. And I didn't really kind of put the pieces together. And it just so happens that my father was uh, retiring out of medicine because he didn't like how the medical field was going in terms of insurance. He wasn't doing patient care anymore. And he was really just trying to stuff his office with as many patients as possible to collect that copay. And because that's what really medicine and turned into. And so he said, Oh, I'm going to go and get into nutrition because that's what his passion was as well. 
So he actually started metabolic nutrition. Uh, he started consulting in the industry as a physician and went into it. And uh, it was only a couple years later, you know, uh, as I was like trying to approach the end of my my uh, graduate studies into what I was going to go into. And I got a phone call from a family member and they're like, hey, your father's super sick. He's really sick. And I, we couldn't figure out what was going on with him. And he was like debilitated and his, his condition was declining and declining and declining. And I literally left school and flew down to Miami. And when I went there, it was uh, uh, like horrific to see the condition of like, you know, a family member, anything that you see in the hospital setting, you see them a month before and they look healthy and you see them now and you're like, oh my God. You know, it takes your breath away. And, and I saw that and I was like, holy cow. And I said, well, and he just told me, he's like, get my, get my house in order, get, go to the company, make sure. And I went there and it was literally shocking. Like it was torn apart. It was the employees were not structured or functioning, uh, to support the company. And I literally at the time called my, uh, my fiance, who was in, in Atlanta at the time. And I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to stay down here and I got to put the company back together. And that's literally how I started. By oh, the way, my, my father, goodness, my father's okay. Oh my so, gosh. Okay. Great news. I was going to ask, cause I'm like, wait, I don't know this part of the story. So yeah, what had, so, what he just had, it was like some kind of an acute issue, but obviously that ripped was, him away. It was, a, believe it or not, he was fine in the hospital. He was recovering, but they couldn't figure out he was having a, a acute kidney and liver failure. And it was actually a drug medication that they were giving to him that was killing him. And so once they got him off it, he like literally bounced back and it was, um, it did its part. It did it. It, it got him pretty good. It, uh, he had a six month recovery with a total year recovery to, uh, totally get the drug out of his system and, and restore his liver functioning and kidney functioning to hundred percent. But in that one year, I basically stepped into the role as the CEO of the company from oh not being involved in the company and starting to grow it. And when he was in the hospital, he was doing about, uh, I would say, uh, I'd say about $500,000 a year. It was a, it was a small mom pop business. It was like, he used to go visit all the health food stores. Oh, himself. So I don't mean to stop you, but what you're saying, gross income, right? And so, so for people gross. listening, some people will be like, oh my gosh, that doesn't sound mom and pop at 500,000. But just so that you guys know, um, that's not the bottom line. That would be the top line, right? Correct. Correct. So and he was by, making a good living, but not um, nothing like way, way over the top because of all the expenses, huh. right, to produce. And, right. Right. And employees yeah. and and rent and insurance that all eats eats at that. And by the time you're looking around, you know, you know, it, my father always had a funny, a funny saying. He goes, "I like to go out to dinner in the movies with your mom on Fridays. As long as I do that and my car is paid for, I'm happy." And that's literally <sighs> he was he, he was literally in the industry for relationships, like. Even to this day, people ask me about my dad. It's like incredible. I will meet like store owners who've been in business 40 years. Like, how's your father? Oh, you know, one time he drove 10 hours to come visit me at my store. I had a store opening. And that's what kind of a little bit of that I brought with me because I was always into the relationship in the industry. But I wanted to add a component to that from, you know, what I was being trained at in school and what I kind of noticed myself was there was a component in making you know, nutritional supplements that was missing. And it's actually funny because, um, when people come visit me or they come, come to my, um, manufacturing plant, they said, Jay, you kind of built this backwards. Like I went into the industry wanting to build, you know, a better mousetrap to say. So I started like every time I could buy a piece of a processing equipment, I bought it, whether if I could buy a blender, whether I could buy a piece of lab equipment, whether I could buy, uh, you know, this um, uh, analysis type of equipment, or or if I could buy chemicals in it for to start building my lab to start doing titration or pH balance testing or any type of you know um, uh, organoleptic testing equipment like uh, colorometer, viscometer, anything like that to make sure my product consistency was getting better and better and better. I would do that. Whereas now looking back, I see a lot of other companies when they hit the market, their, their focus is marketing. Marketing. And you know what? Um, everyone, this completely, you don't understand, okay, this about Jay. And metabolic nutrition is probably the only protein powder that I've ever looked at the label and it has said the calories have been 122. 
or there's a number on there that's not just a rounded number. And I'm assuming that's because you're doing the testing to make sure the exact, all of it's the exact. Like I, I re- distinctly remember there being an, a number that wouldn't just be a zero or a five or because it was precise. Yeah. Well, we, we always try and be very precise. With, that's one thing I always tell people also, um, you know, uh, as you know, the internet has gotten more powerful and more videos and more postings and more information. Um, a lot of consumers are self-educating themselves. And, um, so we get questions all the time. People saying like, Hey, you know, um, how many calories are in your branch chain amino acids or how many calories in this? Why, why do calories go up and down? And I, I, I kind of make it try to make it real simplified for them. And, you know, they even say stuff like, Hey, uh, I bought your container was filled up to the top one time. And then the next time I opened it, it was like three inches lower. Why is it like that? But I waited. It weighs exactly the same. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into manufacturing. Um, I'll be, believe it or not, a lot of physics, a lot of physics goes into manufacturing products, um, you know, uh, from, from product density to the specific gravity of products to, to the, um, you know, uh, you know, the granulation size of products. All that plays into each other on how a product mixes, how it, how it blends, how it flows, how it fills a bottle, how it makes fills a capsule, and a lot of times when people like they they try and oversimplify stuff like, well, why can't it be the same every single time? It's kind of like when you buy bananas, they're not all the same size, <laughs> right? Or or if you buy apples, they're not all the same size all the time. So a big apple is definitely gonna have more calories than a smaller apple, even though it fell off the same tree. So. When in making nutritional supplements, if you don't have a quality lab on on premises, it is virtually impossible to make the best product over and over again. So, um, because you, it would like be I, hard for you; it'd be nearly impossible for you to monitor the quality control there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's you can't. So, like, I'll give you an example. So, like, we can buy whey protein, right? And when I, we buy whey protein, we typically buy anywhere between one hundred thousand to one hundred fifty thousand pounds at a time. Well, in that one hundred fifty thousand pounds could be 27 lot numbers. And in those 27 lot numbers, every single lot number flows differently on our machine. And you have to know how to prepare for that. So I can put it to you this way. So let's say I set the machine and the machine at a dial of, let's say the machine goes from one to 10. And at a dial of five, it fills lot number one perfectly with two pounds of protein powder, right? I put lot number two on there. I don't touch the machine. And then now it's filling at 2.3. And then I put number three lot number on there, and now it's filling at 1.7. Well, you would say if it's all whey protein. I don't understand, Jay. It all comes from cows. Why isn't it filling exactly two pounds in every single container? It's called specific gravity and product density. And that's when actual, you know, calculations to measure all these things makes a difference. And it was important for us when we built our, our manufacturing plant to be able to have quality control uh, in that. And let me tell you, it's never ending. Even though we buy the machinery, we do this, we invest in personnel, it's constantly evolving. I mean, the FDA has put you know numerous things in front of us that says, hey, Jay, we'd really like you to be compliant for this. And we, we, and we, and we match it and we do it and we, and we try and do as best we can. And then, you know, that's why we always put systems in place. That's why you have an SOP, standard operating procedure. Right. And, and that's what helps you develop into your GMPs your, your, or good manufacturing practices. So you start with the SOPs. And then when you make a mistake, you create a new SOP to correct that mistake. So you don't make that mistake anymore. Because making, listen, making products and making uh, um, any consumer goods, mistakes are made. But that's how you have the evolution of products, like the evolution of a car. You know, we're not driving cars that look like they came from 1910 when Henry, when Henry Ford was, was doing them and they were open carriages with little, you know, uh, uh, you know, gas piston, um, motors underneath. It looked like a, like a horse and carriage type thing. (laughs) And now, and now you see cars that we have today and it's an evolution. And that's kind of where I see kind of like the industry changing a little bit is that, that we want to be on that cusp of, of that evolution and always being able to do the best. But I, listen, I, I appreciate the compliment about the, you know, the 122 calories. I, yeah. Well, we I always, noticed, we always try I noticed keep it. the attention to detail and that's, right. what's really cool because you were saying that 
you wanted your own uh, plant and where you can manufacture and have it right there. And that's a huge risk, right? To invest in those things. Oh, I'm assuming because um, you're purchasing these things and there's other ways to go about it. Can you talk about that yeah. a little bit? Um, because I'm sure that it sounds what I'm gathering that you weren't willing to sacrifice your vision for what this was going to look like and the quality and um, just being able to 100% stand behind what you're putting out there. So you were willing to invest more, take less profit in the beginning to make sure that you could do it that way. Yeah, it's, it's, um, well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, you know, there's nothing more frustrating. Um, when you're trying to build a brand, let's say, I don't care what it is. Let's say, let's say it's your restaurant. Okay. Or if it's your, your, your gym, or if it's a clothing line, um, and you're using outside manufacturers or using, um, outside people that you don't have relationships or strong enough relationships with to build, um, a product offering that you're going to be then selling to the customer and, um, and you're stamping your name on it. You're putting your brand on it and they fall short of the quality control that you want or the quality that you want to offer your client, you know? Um, and then that becomes, uh, like a negative basically investment in you in terms of building your brand. So I wanted to build a manufacturing plant. I want to invest into the lab. I want to invest into a quality control department and into a manufacturing department um, so that I could effectively build a product that I could brand. It's very hard. You know, if, if you can come out with a, like, let's say a clothing line, let's say uh, leggings, you're making uh, workout leggings for specifically for women who work out and you're like, we are better than Lululemon. We sell for $200 a pair, but every girl who squats in them tears a hole in the butt or something like that. And then all of a sudden you got a, you got a big problem on your hand because you're not worth $200 anymore. You know? They, yeah. You have a really big problem, right? Because I, I mean, all it takes, people aren't as fast to yell from the rooftops about a positive experience as they are about a negative experience. Oh yeah. So, um, I know that, you know, being in business now, if I really enjoy something, I definitely take the time to speak its praises, but just how it is with consumers, uh, there's not a lot talked about when it's positive, but if you do burn that bridge, it can be really hard to get that person back. So that's a really good point. And then if you have the plant going and you're having to find a team, we were kind of talking a little bit about this before we jumped on. I know for me, the biggest challenge has been team building. And I was just under this assumption of this will be easy to build a team. It will be easy. But I've realized that there's so much to be said for being a good leader, how to find the right people, who's going to focus on... I. I know personally, I have a heart center business. You have a heart center business. Who's going to be focused more on the mission? And this isn't going to just be um, a punch the clock kind of job for them. And what kind of questions do I need? And what kind of, you know, end game are they looking for? And how will they work together with others? It's been so much more than I ever anticipated. And how has it been for you? And how, like, how many people did you have in the beginning, when did you know you needed to hire kind of thing? All right. So, um, this is, I feel the number one question. Anyone who is looking to build a brand, anyone is looking to build a business, anyone, any entrepreneur or anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur or, or is thinking about getting in business for themselves. And they know it's going to end up being more than a one person deal. Okay. Um, they have to understand how to do their, their, you know, how to build the brand internally. Um, which I, we, right before the podcast started, we were talking about in order to build a successful company, you, it, there's like the three P's made famous by Marcus Limonis, who has a, a TV show called the profit. I recommend some people watch it. If they're looking at getting into business, it's, it'll give you a little snapshot really quick. It's half an hour and kind of tells you what, what, what you can look for in, in order to build a successful company. And the three P's are the people the process and the profit. And you have to have those three P's to really be successful. So let's talk about the people. And the reason why people are such a massive component in anyone's brand is you can't build a great brand with bad people. 
bad people build bad brands. And that's just, that's just how it goes. I mean, you don't see people, um, who, who build cars. Like for instance, I'm a big car buff, so I'll use car examples all day long. And, you know, you look at, but let's say Ford motor company, cause I mentioned them prior when there was like hostility in, in the automobile, uh, m- manufacturers industry. And you had, you know, the unions fighting against the big brands like Ford motor company. They were outputting terrible cars, terrible, and they were breaking and they were unreliable. And that's where the big, you know, people started buying Japanese cars and foreign cars, BMW, you know, Porsche, whatever, because they felt like they were better quality than American cars. Now American cars have come back because they've, they've reignited. They've, they've, they've put in better people. Then you look at a car company like Ferrari. I don't know if not a lot of people are, if you're not in the cars know this, but in order to work in certain departments in Ferrari, you're lifers. If you change the tires, you put the tires on a Ferrari, that's all you do the rest of your life at Ferrari. But they have so much pride. They're given titles. They're giving a respect. They're giving, um, um, I always say a great employee understands two things. They understand responsibility and commitment. Mm, I love that. And, it, and if your employee does not understand responsibility and commitment, they're an employee. They're there to punch the clock. So mm, if you, that. so when your employee comes to ask you, oh, I want my review, okay, what their yearly review is, I want my raise. And my first question, I, have, I said, I have two questions for you. What is your responsibility and what is your commitment? And if they can't answer it, they get the standard, they get the, you know, the standard, you know, two uh, percent increase in salary for the year. Or I don't give them anything if they if they really haven't shown any type of effort to grow that position, because I, I know what they're doing. They're filling that position until the point where they're not going to be in that position anymore. But the ones that can answer that are the ones you start growing with. And I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So when you start finding oh, out- Oh, I'm loving want, all of this. This is so much right? gold. Yeah. So when someone understands responsibility and commitment, they start showing a tendency towards leadership. Because then they're going to be able to pass on what the responsibility and the commitment is from people below them. You can never put someone in, in, in a management uh, uh, role in any capacity. I don't care if it's management over cleaning the toilets. Unless they know what their what their responsibility and commitment is, like I have someone who's in charge of my custodial here, and people think that oh that's a joke. Well, let me tell you, keep keeping toilets clean for sixty employees every single day is not easy. It's yeah, not easy. and I mean that's only one component, right? So then there's a it's, thousand it's, other it's, things making sure that it's clean, and you're producing. I know for me, you know, people will think oh that's not that big of a de- that's a huge deal because that's your first impression of what kind of product is that sets the stage. It's like when you walk into someone's home, it really sets the stage for um, how you're going to, it's a first impression about them. Right. It's kind of like you go to a friend's house and he invites you over for dinner and you go over there and when you open the door, it is absolutely the house is torn apart. You're like, Oh my God, what am I eating for dinner? You're not even, you're not even looking at the, at at the house anymore. You're like, you don't know if dinner got made. Like who knows what's happening? Like I'm hoping dinner's going to wind up on the floor, like, or, you know, or, or he didn't cook it in the dog bowl or something like that. So I'm like kind of freaking out. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's, it's one of those things. So once like, like in my company, um, and oh, I, I was going to say this. Okay. So when you find those people that have the understanding of responsibility, responsibility and commitment, you start, you start need to making what I call a chain of command or, 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 mm. or, 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 or the, you know, the, the a responsibility and commitment tree. And literally it is a tree. You put, if you're the owner of the company, you put yourself at the top and you say, where does it trickle down? Where does it trickle down? And where does it trickle down? And so when employees are coming to you and they're asking you about promotions or they're asking about stuff, you can look at this tree and have an understanding of how, where they're in relationship. And you put all the employees on there, even the ones you just hired, even if they're minimum wage, you put them on there. And the interesting thing is you, you make it, you date it and you put it away. And then whenever you have a fire or a hire, you immediately take it out and revise it. You don't ever leave it there. And what you'll see is you'll see employees trickle up the tree and go to the top and you'll see other employees fall off and go down, Mm. which is, whereas when you don't realize it or you'll see someone just stuck, like let's say some, okay, I'll give you an example. My number two guy in my company, guess what he started as? 
Hmm. A customer service rep for minimum wage. I mean, he's That's my number amazing. two guy. How long did it take him? Uh, four years. Wow. So he just was cooking with gas. Oh, cooking. He, he, he was cooking with rocket fuel. Rocket he, fuel. Like, I yeah, love if, that. Uh, 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 if, if, if I was going to a show, he goes, I want to go to the show. I'm like, listen, I can't pay you to be at the show. You don't have to pay me. If, if I had to do an event, I'll do it. I'll, let me pack it. He did it. You know, that's it's, amazing. It, so it's taking the initiative, right. And really trying to go, the, go the extra mile. Do you do any personality testing when you're team building in your interview process or hiring, um, or anything like that? Or do you just have um, certain questions that you have people ask? Um, do you do the final interview just on some, and then I'm assuming that you have other people interview. How many employees total do you have now? Um, well, we've consolidated certain of our, of our areas. Cause now we have machinery that processes fast, yeah, so pretty fast stuff. So right, right now we're hover between 40 to 45 people, but we used to be at 60. Wow. Okay. But, so, but a lot of those were, were what I found, um, were people that were working, but not working. So what I did was actually take people who had an understanding of commitment and responsibility and segue them into higher position roles and gave them more, um, more responsibility in the manufacturing process or whatever area they're in. And uh, then the other position became kind of obsolete. Um, and then I just segued that budget into their salary. So mm -hmm. our, our salary really hasn't changed at all overall for, um, payroll, but it's get, it's giving more to less people. Um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, yeah, you can you run know, leaner. Yeah. You run leaner, but it's kind of like you have a large pizza and you, and you have, uh, you know, 10 friends you invite to dinner and you're like, Hey, I really don't like three of them. And you, you, you tell them like, <laughs> you know, you know, they, they never really helped me out when I'm moving or, you know, when I, when I need a favor or something like that, drop me off at the airport, they're never around. But these seven people are, and you cut you cut the pizza into seven slices, so everyone's getting a bit of, bigger slice of the pie. So it works out tremendously better. And the thing that's cool, I love doing this with having people overseeing. When you work with a couple key players that are on your team, um, there's just less right less cooks in the kitchen. There's just a better chance that there's not going to be uh, any additional headaches that aren't needed. You know, when you can just get by with just as many people and they can stay long-term, then you start getting in a good groove with how we, how you work with somebody, um, how they respond. I've noticed that, you know, everyone talks about in relationships, like the five love languages book, but I've noticed that so much there, it's the same way with employees. Like certain people respond certain ways um, to praise or there's certain things that they need uh, that are different than just financial. And so when you have a smaller team, I think it's easier to pinpoint those little things about people. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Um, I also think that when, when I, when I mentioned about finding the people who know responsibility and commitment and start making them more management, um, I think it's also part of that, that, uh, responsibility is for them to hire their core staff. So, what it gives, it gives them personal pride in terms of their division of the company that they're responsible for and that they're committed to, and that they're not going to bring anyone on their team that's going to want to lose. Mm -hmm. And then when you address that, listen, this is one thing I learned. It's like when I, you know, when I started Met, uh, Metabolic up again, um, we had literally two employees. And, and this was when you say started up again is when that happened with your dad? Um, yeah, it, well... Yes and no, because uh, when my dad got better, I actually eventually just took over the entire company. I bought it from him and then started fresh. And I did it at a great time, which is 2007, when the housing crisis went crazy and banks canceled everyone's loans. And yeah. Yeah, little did I know. So that's when I started was in, um, I bought it in 2007, started redoing stuff. Um, initially, and I'm going to segue, I mean, it's it's kind of a crazy story, but um, I, you know, that, that whole crazy housing crisis and lending crisis and banks were going bankrupt was from 2007 to 2010. And I, I took it over at the end of 2007. So it was really 2008, 2009, and then going into 2010. And, um, in order to get up in business, I had to do work for other people. So I literally was like a consultant 
and I was doing like labor, manual labor to get the funds up to get metabolic running again. Um, and it took me two years to do that. And, uh, and so you're and, working two jobs. Yeah, I was working two jobs. I'd sell metabolic at a certain time. And the other stuff I was doing, uh, private contract work for other companies and it wasn't glamorous. Uh, I remember it was, uh, in, in 2008, um, I worked for five months straight, straight with no day off, no day off, no day off, 12 to 15 hours a day, no day off. This, it reminds me so much of when I went back and I was a school nurse and I was building the fitness business. I worked full time at both things Mm -hmm. until the one took off enough that I could not go back to school nursing And so I, it's kind of a blur for me, but I re- distinctly remember December, January, February, March, April. So I think it was about the same that I was working um, crazy. Just, I, I mean, I don't, re- I slept very little because then, you know, I get my son to bed or something and start working on other projects. And I remember right. making digital downloads and things like that on holidays. And I think that people miss that that's sometimes what you have to do to keep Mm -hmm. the cash flow going and get something launched, it can be pretty uncomfortable for a little bit. Oh yeah. It it was, um, it, it takes you mentally into a different state. I think, I think some people have it. Some people don't, um, like I would, uh, I don't want to say emotionally check out, but I became like a robot, you know, I would just, I, I, I knew what I had to do and it, it did. It wasn't like I'm like superhuman or anything. Trust me. Uh, I, I fell asleep in the shower many a nights, you know, waking up. I'm like, Oh, I'm actually <laughs> sleeping in the shower. That's not good. <laughs> I didn't uh, drown I should, though. This is good. Yeah. I didn't fall on my head. Uh, I should probably get out and go to bed. But, um, it was one of those things that really taught me a lot because, um, it kind of, you know, it's kind of like how you make dar- diamonds. You do it with a lot of pressure, you know, and it hardened me to the point where I know what hard work is. And, like a 10 hour day to me is like laughable. Like, like once you do it, it's like, you know, those guys who run the super miles, you know, they run the hundred mile marathon. Yeah. Like to, to ask them to run like 26 miles, like, ah, they like, they're like, sure. It, but, I'll do it yeah, tomorrow. Like, yeah. I'm going to warm up tomorrow. You know? Yeah. And, I'm done. And, 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 right. Right. Cause they're, they're used to running a hundred miles. So when you are used to working a 15 hour day for five months, like going to work and doing an eight hour day is, is vacation. Totally. It's not work. It's- so when you said, you know, not that I, you said you emotionally checked out and not that you're superhuman, but I kind of want to touch on that because the mental part of all of this is something to be said. And I know that when I was doing uh, the same working the double jobs, I couldn't right. think too hard about, is this going to work or not? Because I didn't have, I had a choice. I could sit there and think about the future and ruminate about all the possibilities of things not working the way that I want, or I could actually do the work. And I don't know if that's what you mean, but that's how I related to it. Because if I spent too much time getting in my own head, there was a greater probability of me calling the whole thing off. Um, The less that I sat there and really overanalyzed, the more I was on task. And then I started seeing some results. So were there times that you did think, a little bit too hard about, oh my gosh, you know, where is this going? What's going to happen? Or did you just, were you 100% convinced that this is going to work? Um, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. So, um, I, I was determined to make it work. I didn't have an option. So I think when you take options out of, out of the equation, then what, what it ends up being is like no option. You're, you, you, like you burn know, all the no boats. Op- but what what made you feel like there was another option? Because you're so qualified. You could go into a lot of different jobs. There was a plethora of, of different job opportunities right. or career opportunities that we were talking about at the beginning. What made you feel as though there was no other option? Um, I, I felt there was no other option because no one was doing what I wanted to do. So, Got it was you. So, so you unique. felt like there was a need in the world for this. Correct. And you're Correct. like, I have to bring this to the table. Right. Like, like this is, this is going to work. And uh, when I say emotionally checked out, I didn't mean like, I didn't care. I didn't, I was oh, emotionally no, 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 checked totally. Out, like, but I, it's like, you're not thinking overthinking, right? Right. I'm not like, like, like it's such tunnel vision. It's like my wife said, like when she would look at me, she would like, I would sit on the couch and like, I could like literally not say anything. 
for hours, for hours, because I was so deep in thought and concentration on what I had to do. It's kind of like when you see, you know, Super Bowl's coming up. When you see those guys walk on the field, they're going to have the, the winner's going to know who's going to win before they even play the game. They're going to go on that field with such tunnel vision. They don't, they don't care what the other team is bringing. And that's kind of like how I was. It's like when I see mentally checked out, like I'll give you an example. Um, people who work for me, uh, say I have a bad habit when I start getting that tunnel vision again and I start checking out and I'm all, I'm just focused on the end result, the finish line. I'm not even understanding how I'm running. I'm just running. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, like one guy turned to me one time, he goes, Jay, none of us have eaten for eight hours. And I was like, so, and he's like, um, we're so hungry. We can't even concentrate on what you're saying. Like I will check, like, like, I, and I'm not joking. Like I've forgotten to eat. I've forgotten to go to the bathroom. I've forgotten to, to like, I don't remember if I took a shower. Like, I don't like simple things that people would remember to do on a daily day, day in and day out basis became an afterthought to me. Like that did not matter. I wanted to succeed. So it didn't matter to me. Like, I love um, that. Yeah. So basically, well, do you think that it was, do you think it's more of a, you're so passionate about getting the project completed and seeing, um, you know, how it cha- it's going to change the world? Or do you think it's more of, um, you're so focused on thinking about the process of how it's going to come to fruition? Um, maybe both. Uh, it, it's, well, I think the primary, uh, um, example that you gave in terms of like, oh, how it's going to change the industry and all that, that is like kind of secondary. It's, it's kind of like, um, I'm more leaning towards the second mindset, which is like, I know what I have to do to get this to succeed. And this is how I'm going to do it. And then the end goal will be that it will be so different in the industry and it will produce such mm-hmm. a great product and people will see it, but it's like, I am going to do this. So I used to put a lot of baby steps in there. Um, so I wouldn't get discouraged so I could show some movement. I felt like the company was moving because it does get discouraging when you're working like that. And, um, you know, uh, you know, it's everything through working through pain, standing all day, you know, and I work with with machinery. Imagine that machinery doesn't care how I feel or how hard I work. I could work (laughs) on a machine for 10 hours, start it up and the same part breaks again. And I start from the square one again. It's kind of like, you know, running the marathon, getting ready to, you know, you know, cross the finish line. And someone says, Oh, the finish line's not here. It's back where you started. And you turn around and start running back the other way. And it was a lot of, let me tell you, it's, it's emotionally, um, it's a lot of, you need a uh, lot of patience. Oh, it's a lot of patience, but it is emotional training. It teaches you like you, you have times of doubt, um, which, which, which is funny. I always laugh. I'm going to drop off. I'm going to jump off topic for a second. I, no, I, I love, love it. I love all, all these people who, and I'm a big Gary Vaynerchuk fan and I love the guy to death. And I think he's done it great for entrepreneurs in the space and all that, but I don't think they train people for what it takes. You know, do you feel like what part? Yeah. I was going to say, dive into that a little bit more. Follow your passion sounds great. It's like great for t-shirts and bumper stickers, right? And it'd make a great movie. But to work five hours, 15 to 18 hours a day for five months and show little to no results, just minute, minuscule results, but you're still going forward. That breeds a different type of person. And what I think people have to understand is like getting to the entrepreneur space is, okay, like let's say you get it going, okay? And I've seen you build your company. You and I have been friends for years. And, you know, I've reached out, even though it's most of the time, it's whether it's on social media or I'm sending you a text message. And I'm like, great job with this. Good job. And those little things of encouragement that, you know, you and I have shared going through uh, the last probably like five, six years um, since you've developed all, all, all your company. It's literally um, one of my favorite things about you. You're so right, supportive. Right. right. So, and, and those are the things that entrepreneurs do for, do for one another. But it's like going through that step and then now we're at the step of now you've built it. You've built Protein House. You've built your personal training studio. You have you have all these things going on. You're working on your blog now uh, and and your podcast and you're doing all these things. And and then people are now coming into your industries or you're into your businesses 
and now you're in the in the role of a CEO, and now your role's changed because you've already built the structure. Now you've got something else to deal with. Now, like me, I don't deal with machinery anymore. I have mechanics, but now I deal with the people. So the first thing when you build a company is the process. The second thing you build with the company is the people. And the third thing you build is the profit. And you have you need all those three things working. If your process is broken, you could have the greatest people in the world. I can't tell you. I know companies where they have the best graphic artists, the, the best marketing per- person, the best accountant, CPA, uh, um, the best salespeople, and it's run like crap and the company goes out of business. Oh, it's crazy. So, so you need the process. And what I was building in those in those 18 hour, 15 to 18 hour days, that was, I mean, like literally an emotional roller coaster, but it was like really training me on what was going to be necessary to build that process. And then once the process was built, then I started building the people. And mm-hmm. the people, let me tell you, is sometimes harder than the process. Because oh, I believe machine, it. If a machine breaks, you, you you throw the broken part out and you replace it. But when your people break, sometimes one broken person breaks other people too. And that's the mm, biggest agree. thing. That's the biggest thing I, I, I've learned in, in, in business is that once you do, okay, so, so let's say you're, you're developing your protein house. Okay. Great example. By the way, I love it. It's oh, my favorite thank restaurant. You. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny. I, 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 I land in, in Gilbert, Arizona and I'm like, oh my God, there are a thousand and one restaurants here. And I literally ate at Protein House twice a day for a week. Oh, I was so excited go- about that. And wasn't I out of town? Yeah, you were out of I town. Because I feel like so- in the grand scheme of things, it really is that our paths just haven't crossed. Right. But so it's like, I, that I'm means so much to me. Yeah. So I'm in town for a week. You're not even in town. I think you were on vacation with your husband. And then like I'm sitting here at Protein House every day, twice a day for a week. It, it was, was those, right. And I was like, was this weird. is crazy. We've completely like switched places. Cause I want to say that yeah. I was even like in the East coast, which was yeah. crazy. Yeah. Thank yeah, you for the compliment with that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And Right. And, and so one of the things I will tell you is that when I was there, the people are fantastic at, oh, at, at protein house. They're absolutely fantastic. And then, so it was great. You built the process, which is protein house and how to do the recipes and how to do this and how to do that. And then the missing component is the people now. And I guarantee you, if you didn't have great people, I wouldn't have been there twice a day for a week, you know, you know, it's so true that people still buy things from people in the regard. And those relationships really do make a difference. And what you said about one person, for some reason, I was saying about negative reviews seem to get more, um, you know, more people want to go to the rooftops and talk about this a negative experience. I think that negativity in general can be extremely contagious if you're not careful and certain attitudes and, you know, how people are showing up in the day and how they represent themselves, um, led by example, it can go such a long way. It really is true. Like the whole monkey see monkey do, uh, if you have right. one person that's in a management position that maybe isn't bringing, the positivity and that vibe that you're looking for, it can, it can kind of just spread like wildfire. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. And I, and, and by the way, I've lived through it. I've made those mistakes. Okay. So, so, okay. So this is like the scenario I'll let you, I'll lead by example through my mistake. So here I went, I built this amazing company, this process. Okay. And I'm making great products and we're taking the product. Like, Oh my God, it's great. Oh, we made the fat, oh, oh, the fat burner is great. Oh, the protein's great. The weight gainer is great. The creatine's great. We're getting all excited, like all these great products. And then my mind shifted to profit. Notice what I skipped. The people. The people. And I'm like, I can make this product cheaper, better, faster, better quality. I'll put it on the market and put it out there. I'm going to invest in people that are going to help me sell this product as fast as possible. And I literally hired the worst group of people I've ever hired in my life. Oh, no. Because they had the reputation of selling whatever they could sell as quickly as possible. They didn't care about the process. They didn't care about the product. They didn't, all they cared about was making sales commission or doing whatever they had to do to, to make the sale and make money. And I thought that would be my greatest, um, I guess, leap forward or, or you know, surge in my business where here I'm going from the 15 to 18 hour day building the process. The products are starting to make great, but then I skip over the people and I go right to profit. And so I wasn't making sure that those people shared my same, um, 
ethics uh, or they shape my same attention to customer service and my same vision in terms of the company. And it is so critical that when you hire people, like I don't do personality things because there are so many different personalities Mm -hmm. that I don't believe that that really um, makes a difference, at least for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I really try and find out like how people are in terms of their ethics, with their belief structure, what 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 they what really makes them happy working company. People are like, hey, I do this, and all I want to do is I want to go home, and I want to like I want to party. I can't wait for Friday. Which, by the way, um, I had a great post about that. I don't Was that like really an interview answer? Yeah. So like, yeah. What my my only interview answer is, or my only interview question that I look for an answer is, I'm like, what's your favorite day of the week? Oh, nice. My, my favorite day is Monday. And you know why? Because I get to service my customers on Monday. They're ready to rock. Right? Uh, and my it's favorite like, for day me, is not, Monday is like a f- clean slate. Well, I, I, can't, I can't wait. I, like, I have all my orders over the weekend. I can't wait to do amazing customer service for these people. Anyone who emailed me or DM me about complaints over the weekend, I can't wait just to exceed their expectations on Monday. Um, oh, I love that. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I answer, by the way, I answer customer email 24-7. That doesn't matter. Customer, I, I, I took the product. I don't like it. I don't like this. They get an email from me. So I Period. love that. What That is so cool, first of all, that you're that engaged with your audience. I still answer all of them myself. If anything comes in, it's obviously not as big of an operation as metabolic, but I think it's important to hear from who's running it and let people know that you know, you're just as disappointed as they are if something didn't yeah. go well. And, yeah, like, um, you know, that empathy and care that's needed to nurture it. And some of the complaints, um, have become my best guests, customers, um, you know, clients from them really understanding that, like, I'm just as upset that something went wrong for them as they are. Right. Um, you, you know, uh, I, I can't even remember what the book was, but I read a book years ago. It's like, it's like, uh, your worst customer is your most loyal customer. That's basically what, mm. what they were saying. And what they were saying is the one who complains the most is the one who cares about the brand the most. What, the ones who don't care about the brand are the ones who don't complain. Yes. And, and give you, and they, they give you the on. feedback to make you better. If you actually right. are open-minded to like what actually went wrong here, you can get that valuable uh, information. I know forever uh, when I got into public speaking, I really didn't want any feedback because it made me nervous. I didn't want to hear about things. But then I realized, and I joke about it when I would do any presentations now about building any debt-free online businesses, that feedback is oxygen because it's the only way you're going to get better. All the positive right. stuff is amazing, but all of the stuff that's the constructive criticism is what is going to shape you to be the better company a coach, person, any of those things. And if you just pretend that you don't hear it, kind of like, uh, you know, I'm not going to hear any of this bad stuff, then you're really missing out. Yeah, it, it's it, it, it's um, it's difficult. I mean, um, I know I've done a couple speaking engagements and sometimes it's it's been kind of nerve wracking. And um, I, I, I don't, I've done like what they call them rapid fire seminars. I hate them. Um, because I think you can be genuine when you speak once and when it, when the thought comes through a different place in your mind and in your heart, uh, as opposed to on a teleprompter, um, then yeah, you know, when you repeat the same speech seven times, eight times, nine times in a day, like the people who are seeing it the seventh, eighth, ninth time aren't getting the genuine emotion. The first one. Oh, is a rapid fire one. Just kind of the same talk. Yeah, it's the same talk and broken into little sessions. I don't do it anymore because uh, I'll do it over a couple days. Um, like if it's like like two like a two day thing, and you speak once one day and speak to another group the next day, that's fine. But I won't do like seven times in a day, and that's what I was doing. Yeah. I start. I would start speaking at eight o'clock in the morning. I would finish at seven o'clock at night. Hey, oh um, by the by the end of the night, I'm like mentally. It's funny. I, it, just a little side note. I I would actually start thinking of other things. Like I would be doing the speech, but actually going through my Monday's work in my Isn't head on stage. Yeah. And I'm like planning. I'm like, okay, don't forget to call the CPA like, mm. and call uh, and, and call the attorney. And then I would kind of catch myself doing it. I'm like, oh my God, where am I in the speech? And I would have to like realign myself. But yeah, that's, it's like, you know, getting back to what we were saying about, you know, um, 
the the questions for the interviews, because I feel like that was one. I love the favorite day of the week. One of them that's worked really well for me is if you didn't work at Protein House, where would you want to work? Because if they're going to pick something else that has a similar mission um, with healthy eating, the food quality, um, maybe different dietary preferences, then I know that they want to stay in there. But if they're like, oh, I don't know, I'll just like go across the street to whatever is closest yeah, when I get in my car, then yeah, there's not the good interest. Smart. Yeah. But right, and like, so I'm like, oh, that's one that I really like. Uh, and I think that some of the interview questions can be so key because when you say, well, what are your ethics and morals? Some people know what the right answer is in the interview, um, but they may want those ethics and morals, but they may not be living them every day. And so yeah. I think that some of these other questions are really cool because it does have them just answer based on truly how they live their life and right. truly their thoughts. And there isn't uh, really a way to, I guess, premeditate that the question will be coming. And I think that's so valuable. And the reason that I was asking you to dig into, you know, what do you think makes it where you don't want, or you don't realize that you missed lunch or the team missed lunch? Because so many entrepreneurs ask me, what motivates you? Like what keeps you going? And I think that a bit having the why down and like you were just saying that when you see the project come to fruition and you know that this is what you want to bring and you know that this is what you want to see happen and you're focused on that, that's your motivation. And then you set little small goals so that you can keep yourself in, on task and stay excited about it. But sometimes at the end of the day, it's discipline, right? I mean, sure. I, I try and explain. I'm like, there's days that I don't feel like it. And... Um, maybe I'm just tired. Like maybe it's been a run of working nonstop, but I can get myself out of that mode in a matter of minutes. And maybe it's right. a certain playlist that you need or a song, or maybe you turn on a podcast that's, um, you know, where you hear something like Jay telling you guys, hey, like you have to have what it takes and you need to pull right. that out of you. Maybe you just need to hear that and then you can kind of snap back into the reality but the commiserating or now the new thing seems to be you can manifest it. And I'm all about manifestation. And I do truly believe that visualization is great. And I do believe the law of attraction and you can really draw to yourself, but there's, it, there's an action that's going to lead to the reaction. And I try and explain, you're not going to be able to just manifest a bag of money in your lap. Like you're going <laughs> to have to go and do these things. And so it's so cool that you were saying that those things kept you on task and kept you motivated and that the reward, it wasn't immediately. And then as soon as you figured it out, right? Like the company changes, things change because you get to a certain level and then you have to shift and then your job changes a little bit and you have to be flexible and willing to learn new things. Um, Because when you started it, and then I know that you kind of backed away a little bit and came back into it, you were saying that the net total top line was 500,000, and the bottom line, who knows after everything was going, but what's like the volume that you guys do now? Because I'm sure it's completely different than that time. Yeah. So um, we, when I first acquired the company, uh, we were doing about $500,000 a year. And um, we've been over the years able to grow it into a company that has done like uh, our, our top year was around $25 million and we continue to grow. So, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. So it's, and, and, and also understand that, uh, and, and while you don't hear like a hundred million and to people are focused on, on like the bigger scale of things, uh, is going, going to the same root of why I was mentioning, like, it's about, you know, that like you build the process and then you hire the people and then, you, and then you, you know, you build the product and then, I mean, you do the process, the product, and you got, you can't forget the people and, and the profit. And, the people part, when you're trying to scale, it's such a rapid, um, uh, it's such a rapid, you know, at, you know, road, it, you're trying to take, you know, the least resistance, you know, the fastest point between A and B, what ends up happening is you start bringing people into your organization that don't share your ethics, your vision, your drive, um, your, your, your focus in terms of, you know, the process. And what ends up happening, it becomes your anchors. They start dragging you down. You start seeing the sales accelerate, but then you see the infrastructure, you know, 
Uh, they don't share the same core response, you know, commitments and responsibilities as some of your other good employees or managers. And it's like, you know, the old saying that, you know, uh, the one bad apple ruins the bunch is mm-hmm. it's a thousand percent true. And I can only tell you that, um, I just re- recently had a termination in, in, in my office. Uh, I'm telling you that within 30 minutes, the levity and the release and and of all the negative energy in the office was gone. Oh, I it believe that. How do you, when you have the team and you're um, like, do you do, I know that you mentioned yearly reviews, but um, the one book that I love is the one minute manager book. And uh, they give yeah, it an awesome. example of, uh, they're great. They're so short. I mean, it's, it's amazing information and condensed, but they gave an, an analogy of bowling and a curtain being in front of the pins if you're not really being transparent to your team, what the goals are, then they don't really know what the target is. Do you have certain uh, like metrics or how do you help them gauge if they're on task? Do you have anything set up for that? Yeah. So um, I think, uh, okay. So it's kind of a complicated question because it goes into like the operations of a company. I, I believe every company, okay. A, you mentioned earlier about routines. I have a structured routine I do every single day. I have a walk path that I do in my company that I go and see every department. I greet every employee and every manager, but I I only sit and talk. I only sit and talk to the managers and their micro meetings are five minutes to 10 minutes long. So I walk in, you know, eight 39 o'clock. Uh, I walk in and I, I have this certain path. People see me on that path. They know not to disturb me. I'm going to, uh, you know, I go to my manufacturing production and purchasing departments first. From there, I go to my marketing departments. From my marketing departments, I go to customer service. Customer service, I go to accounting. From accounting, I go to uh, operations. um, And then operations, I'll go to sales. And then I don't disturb shipping because remember, they're also shipping all the Amazon orders and online orders in the morning. I go and do that at lunchtime when they take their break because they're in the morning, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do that routine every single day. I do it. I have those micro meetings, seven, uh, well, routinely if we're not doing like holiday like crazy uh weekend uh uh work schedules but if we do the five days a week i'm doing five micro meetings with every single department a week Mm -hmm. so no one can say you never met with me you don't know what's going on you don't know this now what i'll say is i'll cover like like today was uh i met with manufacturing and i said hey where are we with our new round of forecasts and what's going on with it um, when do you want to have a meeting this week where, where we can get in depth? And then that allows me, you know, if the person says to me, my manager says, Hey, we're all caught up. No need for a meeting that I put it away. And now I have ex- that extra block free time. Mm-hmm. If they say, Oh, we have some major problems with supplier issues, this and that mentally, it's already prepping me for what I have to have that meeting about later on in the day where I can schedule an hour, maybe an hour and a half where we need it. But if everything's good, I, we can move on. I'd be like, Hey, great. You can just move on keep doing what you're doing gives them a great sense of responsibility uh, and accomplishment. And then it gives me uh, a, a great comfort in knowing that they've taken care of business. Mm-hmm. When they need my help is when they pull me in. Um, other than that, I don't want to mic- micromanage them. Um, it's, it's, and it's very interesting because uh, to have those meetings, you're going to see employees that value them and you're going to see employees that don't value them. Let's see, like you're micromanaging me. Why are you checking on me on me every day? Why are you asking me, like like in Protein House? Why are you asking me if I order the protein? Because our company is called Protein House. <laughs> That's yeah. so funny. If you don't order the protein, I got a problem. You know, you know, it's not called Muffin House. You know, if it's called Muffin House, I'd ask you to. Did you order the muffins today? So, and it, and it, and it's one of those things that um, I always tell people um, when they come into the role at you know. It's very interesting. You come into the role um, as as an entrepreneur, and that's great. And that has a kind of a title. It's kind of like I always consider that that's how you started your business, entrepreneur. That's the person who's doing a startup business. Yeah. But once you develop your company, your company has the process, it has the people in place, it has the product, and it has the profit. Then what what you have at that point now you're a CEO. Yes. Right. And then your your role changes. And your role is about understanding how all the parts of your company are now working because you used to be all the parts of the company. Now you're separating everything 
And now those people, you become responsible for their, that they're hitting their, their responsibility. Success. Right. And their success. And you want, and, and your kind of role changes a little bit because even though you have those four P's working, you know, uh, you also want, um, which I, which I added, I added, um, another P in there. You want to provide because you want to provide opportunity. You want to provide support. Like I love that really you're being, you're there to support. And that's my big thing with my managers. I'm like, how can I support you? You know, what, right. what are you, what's your weakness or what, uh, do you have any questions on and how can I walk you through it? Because we're a team. And before I just start delegating and walking away, there's going to be the whole coaching opportunity of working together on something. Do you guys use right. any software to keep everybody in, in check? I mean, I know that you're kind of making the rounds and people get really interested, um, in like the systems component do you use like task managers for everyone or do you have each department head keep track of what projects they have going on and report to you and vice versa with the five minute meeting and then potentially the longer meeting? Right. So, um, our, our, our program's a little different. Um, uh, so since we, we manufacture, we use FDA protocol type, type of software. It's kind of like very flat and boring and it's very, it's, it's not engaging. It's like, uh, I always laugh because I always call it, um, you, you know, that one program that a lot of people use that it, all the different departments can chime in. I call it Coachella and it's not Coachella. That's I always so call funny. It, I don't know what the name is. I always forget what it is. Is it Slack? Like, no, but it's something like that. Oh, but, Basecamp? Uh, no, no, no. It sounds like Coachella, but it's not that. Oh. Coachella is like that, that music festival. So people are like, I'm not <laughs> That's going why to Coachella. I was just like guessing random things because I thought you just renamed it that, which makes it no, the best. But my employees think it's hilarious every time I call it that. Uh, and we don't use software like that because what we ended up finding is, um, and I don't believe in software like that. The only reason being is it only takes one person to drop the ball and then everyone is micromanaging that one person. You know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Yeah. I go, no, that makes I sense. go back to the trade. So, so, let's, so let's say you have 10 people on a project, right? Well, 10 people on the project, they're all in there at, at the same level. Like right. they're all in at the same level. You do this, like, let's say we're making a new product. Okay, you're doing the formulation, you're doing the label, you're going to do order the raw materials, you're going to do the manufacturing, you're going to do the packaging, you're going to do the warehousing, you're going to do the logistics, and you're going to do, do the sales. Okay? If any one person drops the ball, it stops everybody. Right. But who's in management? Right. That's the thing so, I don't understand yeah, it makes that. It, it's like... So it, Right. It, it would be more sense to have it on or, mm -hmm, the, like the department head. And I think that there's ones that there's different ones for everything, but in all intents and purposes, if you're all in the same area, like you are, it's probably working really seamlessly for you to do the little quick checks to see if they need right. longer time on your calendar. And then you could book it in accordingly. How do you decide your like, do you guys all get together for what your goals are for the following year? Do you just get together for quarterly goals? Um, do you get together all as a team in certain intervals? Um, well, this is, this is what, what I found. Um, you know, we, we try to have team meetings every once in a while. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm by no means an expert. I'm still learning. Um, yeah, but it's just you know, cool to hear how you run because yeah. it's, it's working. What you're doing is working. Right. So we, we're, we're like, um, we're, our company is kind of separated by departments. Okay. Mm -hmm. But those departments all work interchangeably and there those departments are able to like let's say my sales team um i'll work with them specifically on goal setting and this and that and then that's their commitment and responsibility mm -hmm. right i don't ever want them to say well you know manufacturing didn't make this product fast enough for, that's not their problem mm -hmm. their problem is to sell they have to sell they have to build relationships with the customers they have to build those foundations. They have to help work with the customers. And what I tell my salespeople is not, not just sell products, make your customers successful. If you make your customers successful, they'll order more products from you. Mm -hmm. If you just unload product on them and you take their money and then you leave them with dead product, you're not making them successful and you've lost the customer. They'll never trust you again. Never. Oh, I love so, that. Yeah. So I want them to do that part. Now, if we are running back ordered, I'll run in with, with manufacturing. And then I'll work with manufacturing on, on that on, on that portion of it. I don't want sales to be interacting. You know what I'm saying? Which goes down right. to that that program list where 
sales would be like making a, an entry and being like, Hey, where is this inventory? And they're like doing emails and it's like, okay, no. And I don't want to be on a system. I want you to get up. Yeah. You don't I want, want you to, so many cross emails all over the place that you're listen, having to intercept. Listen, especially in today's digital age, um, I have a serious problem with it. If my sales guys or anyone in my office sends a one liner to anybody, I will actually stop my day and go talk to them and be Ooh. like, we're not, we're not a company that does yes. And sends that as an email. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love that. Or, I think that, um, you know, making sure that everyone's speaking, uh, just appropriately, right? Like those short one liner things seem, um, just brash right? and, and can and cause tensions. That, and you, and you also want to, you also want to communicate properly. Like, like I don't allow anyone in my company to send an email to any vendor or any customer or anything without literally their name and contact information at the bottom. It's unprofessional. I, and I don't allow them to send any email that doesn't address the customer. I don't know if you ever like emailed like a fortune 500 cut, uh, like, like company and, and you get like literally a one line email from a customer service rep. And you're like, I don't know who this is. Doesn't have my name on it. Doesn't mention my order number. Doesn't mention my problem. It just says, "Hey, we'll get back to you as soon as we can." Mm-hmm. Nothing. Not like Mike. You know, it doesn't right. say anything. And it's just it 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 goes to the level that communication with clients has to be the same type of communication that your team members play inside your office. They have to have. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like look, like 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 take us. We don't hang out. We're three thousand miles away from each other. But when you email me or you text me, they're well thought out communications and the emotion and the relationship is there. You get it. As soon as you, you get my text, you're like, oh, I get it. I get your text. I get it. I know the communication. I know how the relationship's going. When you don't have that proper communication between your departments and they're using like, like that Coachella program that I, I, I it's not, it's not that program, but it, it's, it's that type of, you know, project manager program. What ends up happening is people lose that sense of responsibility towards the other team members in their company and they start shooting one-liners and it comes off as brash. It comes off as uncaring. And then you have people who develop, this is what my experience is with those programs. People who said, I did my part. It's not my job. And then everyone starts saying, it's not my job. I sent, I did my task. It's not my job. And what they have to understand is, remember when you started this, Carrie, and you did your 15 to 18 hours a day, you were building a process, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're institutionalizing a program that is taking your process and ruining it. And I I can see exactly where, how that could happen because um, people will ask all the time about job descriptions and I'm like, here's the description. But at the end of the day, we're all a team. And on my job description, it may not say... um, you know, cleaning tables on whatever day when I walk in, but I'm going to do that if I walk in there and something needs to be done. It doesn't need to be on my description, but anything that would benefit the, the store as a whole is in under the umbrella of something that I will tend to, and anyone should be open to tending to it. If that means that you're going to have to jump into something that you don't know a lot about, um, it, there's no space for a non-team player, right? Like that's not right. not it. There's no space for that because it's right. like, hey, how can I how can I serve? That's always just the response right. that I think is the most important for everyone to have. And I think going through and thinking of like task assignments and how people respond to that and talking back and forth in the office is so important. I just love the fact that you built this. I mean, you're with two employees and then up to sixty. And I know that, you know, not that employees are a measure of how much volume anyone does, because like you said, you find the right people and you can really eliminate a few positions and give one person more responsibility, which is um, usually what people like. Like they they yeah. want to be able to, like you said, be autonomous, um, know that they can be trusted, um, be a true put their name on their project, it means a lot and it gives them uh, confidence. And then they're going to start, you know, helping more, doing more, being more creative. It really unleashes their true potential. So moving through that and going from such a small amount to managing more of a team, and then you've obviously understood you can't be everywhere at once. 
And I think Correct. another thing is there's so many business owners that will grow. And then in my opinion, dig their own grave because you have to find those people. Like they skip the people step and there's obviously not as much trust there that needs to be or what that looks like. And you can't do everything for everyone else. There was like this little card that went around the internet and it made me laugh so hard because it used to be me. And it was like, if someone could just give me some help around here. And then it said, also me. No, not like that. Here, I'll do it. Because that was yeah. literally my life. Like I'm like, could can I get a little help? But then, oh, I kind of wanted it done my way. And then yeah. when you realize, as long as it is, there's so many different ways. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Having other people's suggestions, you can get the most insight. Asking people's opinions. I've gotten some of the best feedback or the best ideas from some of the employees that I've had that have maybe only worked for me, you know, in the summer, they're still in school. Um, but they're they people all think creative. You don't know where the idea is gonna come from. So I think it's so cool that you've realized now that you have to be mindful of your energy have those meetings and then prioritize your day accordingly. And then I love how you've organized everything where you cut out a lot of the noise or the white noise that you felt like some of the communication software was bringing into the realm and get right to, this is how we're going to communicate. This is how we're going to stay on task and keeping the department separate. My last question is with marketing um, I was talking to you about this. I've always been drawn to metabolic. It's just clean. It's simple. The lines are crisp. I was immediately drawn to see what what else is going on. And you know, you were using the car analogies. And I think that you can aesthetically see something that's pleasing to you, and then you want to know more information. But the eye catching component uh, is something that really draws somebody there. Did you always know that that's the direction you wanted to go, or like how many trial and error type of marketing things did you have to undergo? To get um, it right, I guess. And I mean, I love that you said everything's always changing. So maybe in that yeah. area too. So I'm going to tell you a, a crazy funny story. So um, it, it, when I actually took the company over from my father and I was doing all that stuff, it came to a point. I'm going to back up a little bit, give you a little history. I, I got to a point when it, you know the whole housing crisis was going crazy where I was so burned out. Um, and I was kind of, and here I am building this. I want to build, my dream was to build this pharmaceutical company. I actually walked away from the business for a while because a lot of people weren't into quality. They were building crazy labels. I'll never forget. I sat with a distributor and I showed him my white label and he goes, oh, no one's going to buy that. And I go, why? And he goes, you know, my top seller, you know how many colors he has on his label? And I said, no. He goes, he's got 16 colors on his label. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, how does 16 colors equate to quality? And <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't tie it together. And he's like, I got 16 colors. He goes, you have a white bottle with a white lid or a silver lid at the time. And he goes, and uh, a white label. And all you have is like the flavor. You have the main main color is the flavor of the uh, fruit or the, uh, the chocolate or whatever the flavor was of the product or whatever the product was was the only color on the label and everything else was black and white. Keep it super simple, super, like, it's almost like nutraceutical. It's like a, a, a convergence of nut uh, nutrition and pharmaceutical, like mm -hmm. jamming it together. And they didn't get it at first. And when I first came into the marketplace, I, I remember back like in 2010, when we first launched, like I literally, I had two employees. I had no product in the warehouse. I was at the Mr. No, I was at the Arnold walking the floor, the biggest show at the time with a backpack on with two sample rendering bottles with literally it. I think it had sand in it. It didn't even have product. It literally had sand in it. So when they picked up the bottle, I'd be like, don't open it. It's, it's not for consumption. And it was all sealed up, but it had weight. So it felt like a real product. And I had my whole product line done on print, you know, literally color laser printouts and my business plan. And that's it. And that's how we started. And then we started selling it to distribution and going this whole route. And um, a great book, if any of your clients or followers are, are listening, uh, Zig Ziglar wrote a great book called Zag. And it talks about when, you're, when your competition goes one way, you want to go the complete mm -hmm. opposite way. And what he was basically saying is that when your competition is doing a certain thing, you want to go the complete opposite way. 
because that creates differentiation for your brand. It gives your customer something else to remember you by. So, you know, which is something that's very difficult in our industry right now. Um, it actually is reminding me back of how I started because back in the days of the 16 colors and all these things, um, what was happening is cons consumers were getting confused on what to buy. They, every product looked almost identical to each other. And I said, well, here I am going to put a white bottle with a white label with, let's say if it's a chocolate, it has a scoop of chocolate ice cream in front, or it has a scoop of vanilla ice cream, or it has a, a, a peanut butter cookie on front, or something like that, or you know, a bowl of fruit on front, and that's what the flavor is, where before, it was so many colors, you didn't know what you were looking at. You know, chocolate looked like vanilla, vanilla looked like chocolate, chocolate looked like strawberry. Everything looked like, and you couldn't tell the weight gainer from the whey protein, from, from the uh, keto product, even back then they had some keto products. But you can tell what it was. And I was like, let's create differentiation. Let's create different name structures. Let's create everything that we can do differently. Let's do it differently. And to this day, I still analyze the industry and try and do things differently. And the reason being is that becomes part of the product as much as the product itself. I absolutely love that you were saying that you continue to try and zag you know, as everybody is going another direction, you want to keep on making that part of what metabolic nutrition is and that it's not just going to go in the direction that everyone else is going. And I love, thank you so much for sharing your beginning stages, some of the challenges, what it took to actually get things going, to build a team, how you interact with your team and, you know, just the growth of the company over the time. I appreciate that so much. People don't realize or they just don't understand um, what that process looks like when you kind of like flip the hood up and see how it's running mm -hmm. and sharing that is, is just such a great pearl of wisdom for everybody. And I appreciate it so much, Jay, that we had this conversation. Yeah. I feel like I there's so, so many things that, I, Oh, anytime there's so many things, uh, we're going to have to do another one because there's so many things, uh, and stories I'm sure that you can share with team building. And I know that I can too, um, but it's not an easy path and it really is overcoming different obstacles and being creative and patient and trying and trying and trying. Um, how can people find, I mean, obviously metabolicnutrition.com, you can order. Do you have any uh, certain products or anything that you want to talk about that anyone listening should go and check out? Um, no, uh, actually we just uh, rebranded our metabolic nutrition website and we're doing, um, all great new uh, uh, product offerings. Like we're doing the different, we're going to start offering stacks and stuff like that. We're actually going to be opening a whole new component with uh, some athletes that we're going to be bringing on and uh, trying to provide more information to the customer. Um, I think that's kind of like the next stage. And I mean, my it, favorites, if you guys are wondering what I love, I love the protein powder protozyme. It mixes so well. It digests it amazing. Anyone who has tummy troubles or they're saying that whey protein is bothering their tummy, I highly recommend trying this before you ditch whey altogether because I think that this is going to make uh, the difference for you. Um, your Syndrex fat burner has been number one for I don't know how long. Uh, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's, been almost, it's always sold out. Yeah. Yeah. It's always sold out. And I highly recommend that. Hydrovax, uh, that is amazing. Um, I, I mean, I can't say enough. There's, there's so many, the BCAs taste unbelievable. The creatine tastes unbelievable. Um, my favorite thing is making actually frozen type smoothie, like ICs with the BCAs and the glutamine and creatine that metabolic has. And they are gigantic with barely any calories. It basically got me through almost every single prep. So yeah. I highly recommend just checking all of that out. Jay, thank you so much for being on, oh, thank you. honestly. And I cannot wait to talk to you again about this. You are just such an inspiration. Oh, listen, listen, you're just as, it's funny because as you say that to me, I think you're just as inspirational because it was like, I'm sitting at Protein House a year, literally almost a year ago. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, I can't believe the girl that used to do demos for me at shows is owns Protein House. And I'm like looking around and I'm like, not only does she own this, her and her husband own this, like I am addicted to it. Like I'm going to Gilbert, like I went 14 times in seven days to your restaurant. And oh, I was thank like- Thank you so much for that. That means so much. Yeah. And I was like, this is like absolutely incredible. And it's like, it's, it, and it's funny because um, everyone that has, you know, like I keep in touch with the majority of athletes that 
were working with me when you were working with me. Uh, like, uh, I don't know if you, if you remember like, uh, Sharice, uh, yeah. she was DJ, um, she, she has done, um, amazing events in New York city. She's gone to Madison square gardens. Uh, she did, um, I think she did last year's Super Bowl party for like, uh, uh, I can't even remember if it was like Apple that had like a big, a big thing to do over there or Ford Motor Company. The girl, and here she was a girl who was DJing uh, at our at the demo. Show. I just love it. We need to get a little thing going of like where they are now and re get together the team. I felt like yeah. that was so much fun. But thank uh, you so much, Jay, no, and honestly you. for taking time on this Monday on the holiday and chatting. Um, appreciate it more than anything. And Whatever we'll, you need, I'm I'm always here for you guys. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay, we'll talk soon.